Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is another chapter that is going to get into some end times things. And so I'm always tempted to just, well, flip over here and let's look over there, you know, to break down what's going to happen in the end times. It's exciting. It's also a little scary because there's some things going down in the end. Uh, well, let's jump into it here and we'll see some of these things today. First Thessalonians 5, the Apostle Paul writing along with Silvanus and Timothy, uh, reading from the New King James Version. Here we go. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, oh, here we go. What's the day of the Lord? That's the day when Jesus comes back the second time. That's the day when he comes back to bring judgment on the earth. Oh, this is a big day. This is like after the death and resurrection of Jesus, this is the next major thing when he comes back. And he's going to set things in order when he comes back. Okay, so uh, Paul is saying, we've taught you this. You don't need us to tell you again, but I'm glad he's telling them again so that we would hear it. And he said, you don't need that I write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. What does that mean? There's not going to be promotion going out uh, two weeks from now, Jesus is coming back. That there's God's not going to signal it like that. It's going to come as a thief in the night. In other words, a surprise, incognito. You yourselves know, perfectly know, that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Watch this, verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Wow. So when they say peace and safety. So evidently, see, now the, Paul is tipping us off here. See, the great news is there's, there's not going to be, you know, Jesus coming and saying, oh, not today, but tomorrow I'm coming back. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be like life is going on. Things are happening in this world uh, as normal, but they, but they won't be that normal, to tell you the truth. But to the majority of the population of the earth, the things that are happening will not signal anything about Jesus coming back. They will see nothing of validation of the Bible being true or the second coming of the Lord. In fact, Paul says this, that about the time they start saying peace and safety, see, God is giving us clues. Do you remember Jesus said, uh, he said, you hypocrites, you know how to discern the weather, but you don't know how to discern the signs of the times. And so if we really are people of the word, the word shows us these little hints of what will happen leading up to the second coming of the Lord. And so Paul gives us a hint right here. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And so when they say peace and safety, now let me tell you how I read that, how I hear that. And there are certainly other points of view. But evidently something went on where there was not peace and safety. And then there was a call for peace and safety. There were people announcing, oh, let's, let's do this. Let's adopt this plan. Let's, let's appoint this leader or whatever. When they say peace and safety, then poof, sudden destruction comes upon them. Well, of course, we know when Jesus comes back, who will be in charge? It'll be the Antichrist. And so when they say peace and safety, this will be part of the message, part of his message. Peace and safety, peace and safety. Well, doesn't everyone want peace and safety? Yeah, he's going to be preaching a message that everybody wants. And of course, I, I take it as uh, people want peace and safety from what they currently had from what they currently had. Well, of course, the tribulation period would be horrible. Isn't that right? So peace and safety, watch this. 
When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Oh, it's, it's going to come like a thief in the night to the world, but it shouldn't to us. Isn't that interesting? It should not overtake you as a thief. Verse 5, you are all sons of light. In other words, this is not dark to you. This is not the night to you. You're alert spiritually. You're awake. You know this is coming. It's like you've got an alarm system. You're looking at the, the monitors to see, oh, I see I see a, the burglar coming, right? Well, in the same way, he said, you sh- we should be, as children of light, looking at the signs of the times and noticing, hey, we're getting close here and being ready for this. So he said, this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, talking about spiritually. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let's be, uh, let's be clear-headed about this from a scriptural standpoint uh, with what God has taught us. Let us be sober. Uh, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Paul is revealing a little hint, a little insight here, that there's something about darkness, even physical darkness, like when there's more perversity and sexuality, sensuality, temptation for sexual things at night, in the dark, uh, in secret. There's something about the dark that something about your flesh that becomes more vulnerable. You think nobody sees me. And so you you tend to be more tempted to do things when it's bright in daylight. I'm not saying sin doesn't happen. A ton of sin happens in the daytime. But there's something about darkness. There's something about night. There's something about uh, being concealed. See, and so Paul is saying, we're not people of the night. Not not saying that we don't have a 24-hour period like everybody else, but no, but we live our lives as if it's always daytime, always light, always bright, always out in front of everybody. He said, we're people like that, people of the day. So he says, those who sleep are sleep, uh, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just stop there. Notice he said you have to put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. In other words, if we don't watch ourselves, you'll just watch TV and movies and entertainment and get caught up in all of the rhetoric of the world. And you'll be thinking like everybody else in the world and you won't be a person of the day. You'll end up being a person of the night as well. You have to put on faith. How do you do that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You have to put on love, receiving the Holy Spirit because the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit is love. See, so by putting on these things, by being proactive, like what we're doing right now, being in God's word. See, you're putting on faith. You're, you're now more believing the things about the end of the age because you're hearing the word of God about the end of the age. See, and so you're doing the work right now. Stick with this. Keep doing this. Do this on a regular basis constantly. So he said, uh, for God did not appoint us, verse 9, God did not appoint us to wrath. God did not appoint us to wrath. Now, many people would take this and say, that scripture tells us that before the tribulation period hits, we're all going to be raptured out of here. Well, it doesn't say that. It just says God has not appointed us to wrath. Okay, so it is true that the judgment that's going to come on the world at the end of the age, that judgment is not for the believers who are walking right with the Lord. That is absolutely true, and this absolutely includes and means that. So that's without question. Okay, whether or not that means that the rapture will take place before or at the beginning of the tribulation period, that doesn't spell all that out. It just means we were not appointed for that judgment and that wrath. Okay, so for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, you could be in the middle of the tribulation period and still have salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life and such. 
Okay, so there's there's spec there's dispute there. There are differences of opinion there, but I I try to take this based on all the rest of the scripture and allow it just to say what it said without having to take it a step further and say therefore that means that this is when the rapture happens or doesn't happen. Verse ten. Uh, it says, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whether you've already died or whether you do die before he comes back or whether you're still awake when he comes back, that we should live together with him. We'll both end up in the same category if you're a believer, if you're walking with Jesus. Verse 11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing and we urge you brethren and this is this is important too he's changing topics but he said and we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake be at peace among yourselves so he's saying to them we urge you don't discount those leaders that you have those people who serve you, those people who minister to you, those people who have laid their lives down uh, for the cause of ministry to bring these spiritual things to you. He said, Here, here's how to treat them. He said, recognize them. That doesn't mean, oh, I recognize that guy. No, give them recognition. Give them recognition that you recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. So he's not just talking about that you know, your assistants who serve you. No, he's saying, and are over you in the Lord. In other words, they've been appointed by God as a pastor, a leader, an apostle, somebody over you in the Lord. And admonish you, people that admonish you, people that are bringing instruction to you. And even it's at some time, correction. Verse 13, and to esteem them, esteem them, notice, very highly in love for their work's sake, because of what they're doing to be a benefit to you, even if you don't always like what they say or do or how they bring instruction to you, but esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So Paul is teaching us here that the way that a lot of people treat their spiritual leaders is not appropriate. And Paul's saying, no, you don't do it like that. You need to esteem them. You need to recognize them. And you need to uh, esteem them this way, very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those, warn those who are unruly. Now, coming right off of what he was saying, there are some who will not be ruled. They will not be told what to do. They will not be instructed. They will not be corrected. See, and they're going to pull themselves out maybe time and again from leaders who want to help them, who want to instruct them, want to disciple them, want to uh, see them move on to higher levels of maturity. And they don't like it. They don't like being told what to do. They don't like uh, being in disagreement. And so they end up leaving or they, worse yet, they stay and they sow discord. God hates that, by the way. It's one of the things God says he hates in uh, Proverbs chapter 6. But they sow discord. But notice it says, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Warn them. Warn them. Why? God is not going to put up with this. They will be judged for that because they are supposed to be under those leaders and to esteem them and walk in them. Like Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey those who have rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. He said, if you're a grief to your overseers by the way you don't listen, don't respond, don't work with them, don't follow them, then he said, that's unprofitable for you. Not only are you a grief to your leaders, but that's going to be unprofitable for you too. You're not going to make it very far down the road. So he said, obey them and be submissive be a joy to work with. See, and so uh, our flesh doesn't like this, by the way, but this is reality. This is what God has called us to do. And so he said, warn those who are unruly. Warn them that it's not going to be good for them if they continue down that path. Comfort the faint-hearted, those who are, uh, you know, they're discouraged and they're, they're ready to give up. Comfort them. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. 
So to, really, Paul is just breaking this down and saying, whatever type of person they are, or whatever people are going through at the time, help that group of people, help those kinds of people, help these kinds of people. Verse 15. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. He said, we don't want to get into a tit for tat. We don't want to get into a, and repay evil for evil. He said, that's not the way we are in the body of Christ. We're not trying to one-up anybody or trying to get even with anybody. No. He said, let's make sure we don't do that. Verse 16, rejoice always. Oh, that's one of the shortest verses, two words. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Well, what if you're going through a hard time? What if you're having a bad day? Rejoice always. There's always something to be thankful about. There's always something to rejoice about. Pray without ceasing. There's another small verse. Pray without ceasing. We need to get into a habit of having a constant conversation with God. You get in the car. Well, bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping me today, Lord. Praise God. You walk into the house. Praise God. Had a good day. Did you guys have a good day? Thank God. Thank God. Well, Lord, help us here today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for our evening together. I mean, we need to get into a habit of just praying without ceasing and even praying in the Spirit in spiritual language. Verse 18, in everything, I love this verse, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Here it is. One is, in everything give thanks. Not for everything. Not everything is <laughs> thanksgivingable, if I could say it like that. Not everything should we be grateful for because sometimes the devil's doing things or people are mistreating us. But in the middle of that, we have something to thank God for. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is the will of God that we are a grateful people. We are a thanksgiving people. And so this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. The Spirit wants to move. The Spirit wants to move in you. The Spirit wants to help you to do and not do things and such. Don't quench that. But in other people or in the church, the Holy Spirit's wanting to move. Don't be one that's always poo-pooing that and keeping things in the natural and not allowing the Holy Spirit to ever speak and uh, to work. Verse 20, and there are lots of opinions on that, by the way, and that there are ditches on both sides of that road. People that quench the spirit too much and people that allow too many things that are not all the spirit but it's it's the flesh but it's titled as the spirit you're quenching the spirit well it wasn't the spirit see and so there's a lot that's a big discussion we can get into another time but nonetheless don't quench the spirit do not despise prophecies i think that uh there are people that because when people operate in prophecy, especially personal prophecy, and you're prophesying to people, that people miss it. Sometimes people miss it. And the bottom line is, when somebody wants to prophesy, oh, they roll their eyes, whether literally or in their hearts, they roll their eyes, and they just like, oh, I'm tired of all that. I just, just give me the word. I don't want all that prophecy stuff. But he said, but don't despise prophecies, because even if people have missed it, God still wants to speak th prophetically through people. And so don't despise it. Don't begin to discount it and squash it and not allow f uh, opportunity for it because God still uses it. So do not despise prophecies. Verse 21, test all things, hold fast to what is good. Test all things. Well, I, I think this refers to the prophecies that when prophecies are given, don't just swallow them hook, line, and sinker, and just presume every prophecy that's given you is from God, even if you like it. No, test all things, and just hold fast to the ones that are good. I, I've had so many people give me prophecies, and many of them so encouraging. I believe they're from the Lord. But there are some, some encouraging ones that I think people were trying to encourage me, but I don't know that it was a word from God. But other ones, people were trying to maybe correct or whatever. Well, some correction can be from God. But I, I'd say... Uh, there are quite a number of times where uh, I was given a word, but I'm telling you, I took it before the Lord and uh, I became convinced that's not a word from the Lord, but I'm not going to attack that person or dismiss prophecies altogether just because somebody missed it. But what do I do? Test all things and hold fast what's good. 
So I'll hold fast either the prophecies or the part of the prophecies that are good. Sometimes God gives a word, but the person gave a paragraph. And so you can't accept the rest of the paragraph. But the word that they shared was right. And we should test all things, hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Boy, what a powerful little verse. Abstain from every form of evil. Well, what should we abstain from? Abstain from every form of evil. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I love this verse too. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Well, what is completely? And may your whole, whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you as a whole person, that's where we know how we're made up. You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. You're not made up of, you know, many other parts and such. Well, of course, within your soul, there's your psyche, there is your emotions, there's your will, and so on. So there are subparts to these, but the three main parts that we have, spirit, soul, and body. But I love this. He doesn't say body, soul, and spirit. No, he says spirit, soul, and body. When you get born again, let me tell you that spirit part of you is the part that's most linked to God. Don't put that on the back. Put that on the fore, the, in the forefront. Follow the spirit man who is following the Lord. And so may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. He who calls you is faithful. If God called you, he'll, he'll be faithful to follow through with this to preserve you spirit, soul, and body. So... Uh, your spirit, if you're born again, is already changed. Your mind, your soul is being renewed by the word of God. But your body, our bodies, we're in complete faith and dependency that one day God will change our bodies. It, just like we read uh, back in the fourth chapter of First Thess Thessalonians. God will change our body. He said, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. Thank God we're going to get all completely saved, not just our spirits as they are now if you're born again, but your mind, your soul, and also our bodies. God is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. That's another short verse. Brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. Paul would on occasion ask the people to pray for him. Because he's trying to do his job. He said, I pray for you, but pray for me too. So we need to pray for our leaders. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. This is not some kiss on the lips, but this is a, a holy kiss. Holy would be pure, a pure kiss. And uh, this would be a, a greeting of brethren, an affection. We're showing the affection of the Lord for one another but in a very pure and uh, moral way. This is not uh, something that would be compromising, say, to uh, a married married couple and such. And by the way, this does not mean that now we have to make this a new pattern where we all go around and kissing each other and wives kissing other men and husbands kissing other uh, uh, wives and such. It's like, that's not what he's saying here. There's a cultural uh, thing built in here of the way that, you know, they would do, you know, and we've seen this. This is not a U.S. thing, but in other cultures, we've seen the kiss on both cheeks and such. And sometimes they'll even go back and forth twice like that, you know. And so this was part of their culture already. But Paul said a holy kiss. In other words, we're not doing this just to butter somebody up so that we can make a business deal with them. No, but we're the, when we greet one another, the point is this. When we greet one another, let the pure love of the Lord greet and encourage and show the affection of God for people. Let, let it be holy. Let it be pure. Nothing that would be compromising. And by the way, I think this is a good point in the body of Christ when we greet one another in a church, a house church, a campus church, whatever, that when we greet, say, say you got a married lady, and when she's greeting uh, another person, another man, uh, a man, I should say, when a married lady is greeting a man, she should not greet him in such a way that gives him the idea that maybe she was flirting with him. No, this, this happens. And sometimes our flesh, because we like people to be attracted to us, we begin to do these things. But let me tell you, Paul said, no, 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 no. 
greet one another, but with a holy greeting, a holy kiss. And make sure that you do it in such a way that people sense the pure love of the Lord and nothing that would be of deception or flirting or anything like that. And so I'm not saying that Paul had that specific thing on his mind, but I believe the Holy Spirit, when he says a holy kiss, greet one another with a holy kiss, that holy is pure. And so there's something about this exhortation that the Lord's giving us, and I think it relates to our world today, certainly as much as at any time, that the Lord's saying, when you greet, make sure for it to be holy. Well, that means you got to confront whatever is in your heart that may not be holy. See, because our our... Our society allows for a duplicity. Our society allows for a double life happening. Like, yeah, on the outside, you can't prove that I'm doing anything wrong, but in my heart, I've got a little something else going on. And Paul said, that's not holy. Greet one another with a holy kiss, with purity. I charge you by the Lord, verse 27, that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So he's saying, make sure to read this to everybody. Don't just get it as leaders, and a few of you sit around and read it, but not let the rest of the church, the body, read it. Make sure this is read to everybody so that everybody receives the word. Thank God it wasn't only read to everybody in in Thessalonica, but it's being read today by us. Aren't you glad to be a recipient of this, these truths from the Lord? Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.